Dear Archbishop, Since the 1st of May, 1980, there have been four priests killed here in the country. At one place, there were about 60 men in the church lined up by the wall, and they killed every fourth person. The country here is in rebellion, and the government is taking it out on the church. Three men walked into the rectory in the middle of the night, and then they found the young man that was staying in the rectory. With the threat of the gun, he took them and said, Padre, they've come for you. You could see it in the knuckles of his hand. He had protected himself from the blows, but they, they shot him two times. If it is my destiny that I should give my life here, then so be it. The shepherd cannot run at the first sign of danger. Sincerely in Christ Jesus, Stanley Rother. He had the courage to be whatever God called him to be, no matter what that meant. And that's why he is such a perfect saint for us in our day. He was an ordinary person from a small town farming family. He was born during the Depression. I'm sure he was formed from what it took to make a farm go in Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl. When we come home from school, you walk after the cows, you bring them up, and then you milk them, separate the milk, stuff like that. By that time, it's supper time. Immediately after supper, we pulled a chair out and knelt down by our chair and said the rosary. That's what I remember. We were taught religion in school. We were quizzed on it every night by our parents, especially mother. We knew most everybody in the class because they were either related or neighbors. We made out pretty quickly. We don't tell on each other when we get home. <laughs> everybody knows everybody and work together, but I think that that was essential in developing the ethics that this is what we're called to be as Christian and what we're called to do as servants of one another. I think all of that comes from being in that kind of community and atmosphere. And so when everybody expected Stanley to say, I'm going to stay here and be a farmer, and he said, I'm going to the seminary, that's big. There's so much to learn in this short time. My grades are not the best, but that doesn't mean that I didn't learn much this summer. His life in the seminary, he was always doing a project. There were all kinds of things in the seminary that he was perfectly comfortable with. Studying was not one of those things. He was putting forth the effort, but books were in Latin, and he didn't know Latin. And um, it just was too much for him. Took final test in Latin 13 and probably failed. I'm pretty disgusted and wish I could quit now. When he was asked to leave, it was certainly a judgment on his academics. I don't think for him it was a judgment on his character. He was confident in the call to the priesthood, so much so that when he failed, he said, I still feel called to be a priest. That's, that's gutsy. <laughs> After you're sent home and told that you really should consider a different vocation <laughs> to say, no, I, I still feel very called to the priesthood. And then the bishop, with his generous response of saying, I will find you a seminary. Father Rother was ordained in 1963, about the time that the Oklahoma mission was getting started in Guatemala. And within five years, he had volunteered and was off to Guatemala. The people themselves are quite exceptional. There's great poverty. The normal income for many families is $50 a year. Their main staple is corn, grown on a little plot, maybe as much as a three or four hour walk from their home. When he came there, you know, a large proportion of the population suffered from malnutrition. Infant mortality was approximately half of the children died before age six. 
the Oklahoma missionaries before him and then him when he arrived in 1968 were dealing with a, a situation of great human need. So when he got to Guatemala, he has to make things work in this village that's cut off from the rest of the world. For him, that's the place where he can make a difference and a place where his life is going to intersect everybody's life. Father Francisco demonstró el amor de Dios que no solamente es predicar, decir, sino que también es hacer a trabajar en muchas formas como ayudar directamente a la población. He was able to establish co-ops to make it more profitable for the small farmer. He was part of opening a radio station, a school, then a hospital. One of the most meaningful projects that he worked on was translating the New Testament to their language so that they could hear the gospel proclaimed in their own language. That's huge. He put his whole being into it. He put his whole heart into it. And that obviously became apparent when things began to change. The country here is in rebellion, and the government is taking it out on the church. The low wages that are paid, the very few who are excessively rich, the bad distribution of the land, these are some of the reasons for widespread discontent. The church seems to be the only force that's trying to do something about the situation, and therefore the government is after us. In the context of Guatemala, the ruling class would begin to characterize those who worked with the poor as being communist sympathizers. And with that, the church began to become a target of persecution. The violence didn't come to Santiago until really 1980. The army has moved into the town, and they have a, like a town meeting stating that they were there to protect the people, to keep them from insurgents. And Father Stan Lee was listening to him politely, and then as soon as he said the word protect, his hand shoots up and he says, if you're here to protect, why are my people disappearing? That wasn't happening before you arrived here. The tactic of the government has been to kidnap those they think are leaders, torture them, and kill them. We had just witnessed the kidnapping of someone we had gotten to know and love, and were unable to do anything about it. They had his mouth covered, but I could still hear his muffled screams for help. For him, it was always about being their shepherd, being their pastor. And I think he struggled with how to minister to them in that violence. He provided food for widows and children of those who had been kidnapped. He allowed young people to spend the night in the church building seeking refuge from the military. He looked for the bodies of those who were missing. He simply tried to be a shepherd for his flock, and the wolf was attacking from all sorts of directions. At the first signs of danger, the shepherd can't run and leave the sheep fend for themselves. I've invested too much of my life here to run. I think the more threatening things became, the more resolute he would become. That was in his nature. He may have been soft-spoken, but underneath his quiet nature was steel. Of course, when he heard that he was on the death list, I mean, he certainly took that seriously. I think once his name was on a death list and he saw that his associate pastor was also on the death list, that's when he came back to Oklahoma. After working there for 12 and a half years, I feel almost like a Guatemalan, and I still want to return. The big question is, should I take a chance and go back? Nobody has yet convinced me to stay here. He spent a lot of time standing at that west door there, gazing out that west door, just staring, you know, and he wanted to go back so bad. He knew he could probably be assigned a nice, comfortable parish in Oklahoma, live out his priestly life in a much more conventional way. But he had given his heart, you know, to his people. He belonged back with the people. When he was removed from them by coming back here, 
he felt that he had abandoned them, and in a sense, he did. A shepherd should not run, and that's what he was telling me. And I, and I could hear him, I could see him, and I agreed, yes, you're correct, go back. I did not think I was sending him to death. I didn't probably realize how fearful he was because he was so intent on going back. But he had to be fearful because he knew what was happening. He would describe that if I'm ever kidnapped, they'll never get me out of the rectory alive. That was really chilling to know that those were the things that he dealt with every day. It had to have been a difficult decision, and yet on the other hand, not because he was so confident in God's providence. Everyone acknowledged he knew he needed to go back. Stanley's life was that parish and those people in that situation. And so being cut off from that parish was, I mean, that was killing for him. Again, if he'd stayed behind in Oklahoma where it was safe and, and watched from a distance while those people suffered, that would have been a life less for him than to go back and do what he needed to do to remain their shepherd. He didn't go back to Guatemala to die. He went back to Guatemala to live. He himself said, I promised them I would be back for Holy Week. And that's what he did. Going for Holy Week, that had to have been a really powerful experience for him. And the fact that his return was precisely at that time, I just have to think that he must have really identified with Jesus. When he came back, it had to have had a tremendous impact upon them. I mean, just in terms of giving them courage, giving them confidence, as they were confronting their own fears and dangers to know that they were not confronting them alone, that their shepherd was in their midst. He would give his all as Christ gave his all, and that even after Father Stan had suffered martyrdom, they had to have confidence that, that the Lord was still with them. On July 1st, an Italian Franciscan from the eastern part of the country was shot while returning to the rectory after a mass in the rural area. That makes six priests killed outright and two kidnapped since May 1st of 1980. Keep us in your prayers. He did what was needed to secure the parish property. He changed the locks. He began to sleep in a different room. And he also thought through what he would do when and if they came for him. On the night of July 27th, he actually celebrated Mass. And then he had a dinner. They listened to music. They laughed a lot. He tried to bring a little joy to the tension. And he excused himself and he went to uh, the room where he had been sleeping. In the middle of the night, three men walked into the rectory. Father defended himself, he was cut. While still alive, you can see the blood splatters on the wall. When the sisters and his friend who were staying there heard the shots, they came running. The men had already run out, and he was already dead. <laughs> They started collecting his blood and put it in these jars. And that was one of the jars that was on the altar later. They knew that it was martyrdom from the beginning. 
as the word of his death traveled, hundreds and hundreds just showed up at the church. The murmur of the people sitting there was, they killed our priest. Mataron nuestro pastor, our shepherd. It was thousands of people there in that little square looking up. What a sight that must have been. Father Rother had told one of the sisters that if they come for me, light the Easter candle and sing Easter songs. And that's what they did. And got people to turn to their faith as the lens through which to view what they were dealing with. Second century Tertullian said that the, the blood of martyrs is the seed of Christians. And when Christians die for their faith, it can be expected to bring about a renewal of faith in others. And it's been a, a tremendous renewal of the church. The parish is founded in 1547. There was not a single vocation to the priesthood from that parish in over 400 years. Since 1981, there have been nine priests ordained from that one parish. And they've got another seven in the seminary right now. Right there is a powerful measure how his blood was a seed of faith. Stanley's commitment has such an impact on everybody because it invites us into what a life in Christ is supposed to mean. All of us are called to become saints. And so we really do need real life flesh and blood, men and women who responded to that call and shows us what a life of holiness really looks like. The beatification of Stanley Rother is of tremendous importance to all of us who are the body of Christ. He is the first American martyr. He is also our example of what it means to live what we are called to live every day. The fact that a regular guy from a small town can hear God's call and say yes until it called for his martyrdom. We're not all called to be martyrs, but we are all called to answer that yes. And isn't that the story for all of us? Isn't that what sanctity and sainthood is supposed to be?